He was the man no prison could hold, the handcuff king, the man who walked through walls, the greatest escapologist of all time. He was Harry Houdini, the most exquisite showman of the age of showmanship, emperor exponent of the art of vaudeville and the highest paid performer of his era. It seemed to all who watched that there was nothing inside or outside a theatre from which he couldn't escape. Anybody and everybody could bring their own ropes, locks, handcuffs, straight jackets and chains. Tie him on a chair, manacle him in the air, seal him in a safe, or sink him in a crate in an icy river. Houdini, as always, came up smiling. his abilities became legend and the legend grew. So powerful did it grow that in his lifetime occult powers were attributed to him, in which even some intellectuals like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle believed. Unless there were some supernatural explanation, they said, how could a normal human being free himself as Houdini did? Over the years, the admirers, the imitators and Hollywood have all contributed to the growing legend and distorted the already extraordinary adventures of this amazing man. Who was the real Houdini? What was the truth about him? We asked Walter Gibson, a close personal friend in whom Houdini many times confided, and a prolific writer on his magic. Milbourne Christopher, the most highly paid magician in America today, who spent a lifetime studying and learning from Houdini. Sidney Radner, an intimate friend of the Houdini family and now the owner of much of Houdini's extensive collection of props and equipment. James Randi, a brilliant escapologist who's frequently risked his life attempting some of Houdini's most dangerous underwater escapes. New York's Coney Island, 1894, where the bill of a small-time dime show includes the one-eyed giant, the two-headed sheep, the fat-bearded lady, and Harry Houdini, magician. Born Eric Weiss, son of an immigrant Hungarian rabbi, he's struggling to make his act coin him five dollars a day by swallowing needles, producing coloured handkerchiefs, and an altogether unexceptional repertoire. His most spectacular vanishing trick up to the age of 20 had been to disappear with Bess, a Roman Catholic girl, and after two weeks' courtship, emerge as a married magic act, the Houdinis. Life in a travelling circus was hard and degrading for Houdini. He was forced to double as the genuine wild man of Borneo. The star feature of their act was the great metamorphosis. Behind a curtain, Harry, sealed in a padlock trunk, did a rapid change with Bess. Neither the audiences nor the vaudeville booking managers took more than a passing interest. But Harry had acquired the beginnings of a new skill. Manacles, padlocks and handcuff escapes were soon an integral part of his act. Here he saw was something which the exceptional mechanical mind he possessed, combined with a superbly trained and powerful body, could raise above the level of the despised circus sideshow and into the big time. All he needed now was high-powered publicity, and that road was yet to be a long haul. But no road deterred the great Houdini. Five feet three in his handcuffed, stockinged feet, he had a small man's enormous ego, and with it an overpowering and ruthless determination to succeed. In 1899, he took on the Chicago police and escaped from their strongest handcuffs. But he was working in an overcrowded profession where even the mildest success attracted a score of imitators. If he saw any other performer who was doing handcuff work, or even one who might be doing handcuff work, just anybody who might be a future uh, obstacle or uh, rival in his path, he would do anything to belittle their act and even send people on the stage to cause trouble. Houdini had a bag filled with legitimate cuffs that he didn't think the other performers could get out of. 
and he in person would frequently attend the performances and demand that the escapologists get out of the cuffs. Some less resilient than Houdini, unable to cope with his challenges, found their careers in early ruins. His mastery of handcuff escape took years of study. He had superb dexterity, stamina, and extensive knowledge of locks, and remarkably the ability to swallow and regurgitate a key. He developed a genius for working in a new medium, a genius not much appreciated in the United States. He would conquer America by way of Europe. In 1900, on a cold spring morning, the handcuff king set sail for London with his wife, a one-way ticket, $50 in cash, and not even the promise of a European engagement. His only asset, besides his body and his set of handcuffs, was a leading impresario's testimonial stating, the Houdini's act is satisfactory and interesting. But typically, he'd studied every British-made lock and key he'd been able to lay his strong fingers on. His most valuable possession was a collection he'd made of these keys and a suave ability to use them with his toes. So the first thing he did was familiarize himself with English handcuffs, and he found that the standard Scotland Yard handcuff of the period could be opened if you just knew how to bang it at the right spot. So he went to Scotland Yard and offered to get out of their cuffs, and Superintendent Melville locked him in a pair, and Houdini stepped into the other room and came back free. And Melville was smart enough to tell him that that was great and admit that he escaped from those Darbies, as they called them. And the next thing you knew, Houdini was being booked throughout England. He'd caught on. Throughout the country and throughout the rest of Europe, he soon became top of the bill. The formula of the exploitation of free publicity followed by a high-priced stage act, plus the public challenge, had taken Houdini where he felt he belonged. He was happy to take on the world, and happy if the world took on him. To the public of Europe, he was fair game. Houdini in town meant Houdini challenged, sometimes from the most unlikely quarters. The secret of the rope escape lay in his phenomenal muscular and bodily control. He'd expand his muscles to their considerable limit whilst being tied. It mattered not at all how many times a rope was knotted around him, for later, muscular contraction would give him enough working space for his powerful fingers to effect a release. Some people had a big, huge butter churn and they wanted to put Houdini in that and clamp the lid on the top. The lid went flat on the top and then clamps were thrown over. So it wasn't a question of padlocks or handcuffs. It was a case of getting through this woodwork and somehow getting those clamps open. Well, Houdini, as he always did with his challenges, figured some way to beat this thing. And in this particular case, he supposed there'd be a good way that he could wedge his way out. Drives a sort of a wedge in between the top and the, of the churn and the lid, and spring the clamps. He knew it would take some time. So he specified that this churn, which was made of wood, should have holes bored in it so that he could breathe, as with all escapes from boxes and other items like that. That was agreed upon, so the escape started. He was put in the churn, the clamps were on, he was in a cabinet, isolated from the audience, and the orchestra began to play and uh, played loud so that no noise would be heard coming from the cabinet. But as Houdini began to work on the top, he suddenly found himself running out of air, and he realized that the holes had not been bored properly or there were not enough of them. There had been some uh, misunderstanding. He had to get out of that in a hurry or he would suffocate. In the emergency, he decided upon an unusual thing, but I think always he came through in those instances. In fact, the mere fact that he survived was proof of that. He began rocking back and forth in order to upset the churn so that it would roll out of the cabinet down toward the front of the stage. His assistants would then stop it, 
open it and uh, think it was merely an accident that it overturned and uh, he would say bore more holes before I resumed the escape. As, it, as he toppled it, it landed right upon one of those clamps and sprang the whole top open. And suddenly he was half out of the churn and grabbing it to keep it from rolling out because all he had to do was stand it up, put the top on again, put the clamps back in place and come out completely freed with a terrific mystery. And that was the one escape that worked itself. But luck played very little part in the success story of Harry Houdini. Success had brought money, and money had bought a traveling workshop and a team of skilled mechanics. He developed a locksmith's memory. One glance of a key enabled him to memorize its pattern and have it faithfully reproduced in minutes. Other challenges required other techniques. Among them, the reputed ability to dislocate and replace his shoulder blades to get the necessary freedom of movement within a straitjacket. Houdini found he could repeat his well-tried formula in every city of Europe. With no reluctance whatever, he engineered the police forces, the armies, the navies of France, Germany, Britain and America to turn him, a one-time $5 a day dime museum act, into a $3,000 a week star performer. Soon, he'd escaped from countless jails. Bradford, Salford, Halifax, Leeds, Newcastle, even from the condemned cell of Charles Peace in Sheffield. But his fame and fortune depended, as always, on his singular ability never to fail. He was put into a jail cell that he knew was going to be difficult to start, and he had to have a special type of pick. And somehow he smuggled that into the jail cell and began to work on the lock when he found to his uh, dismay that it was inadequate. Um, however, he kept on. It looked like the end of his career if he didn't get out of that cell. Finally, he started again, took one rest, and leaned against the door of the jail cell before starting over, and all of a sudden the door went open. They had forgotten to lock it. Now, the most sensational jail escape was in Washington, D.C., in the United States jail. At the time, there were other prisoners in the cell block, which was called Murderer's Row, and Houdini, as usual, in what he called a nude condition, was shackled and put in a cell, and the officials went to another part of the building. And when he finally came into the office where they were seated, he pointed out that he not only had escaped, but he had moved all the other prisoners from one cell to another. A fantastic exploit. No matter how fantastic, in theory, any escape is possible with a concealed key. But what if you are inside a U.S. mailbag? and apparently unable to reach the padlocks on the outside. Houdini found a way, and on feats like this, vaunted his reputation. In some theaters, he had large vaults brought in. He would be placed inside, perhaps with handcuffs or even a straitjacket on, or perhaps bound hand and foot. The door would then be closed, the locks all fastened tightly, ropes wrapped around the outside and twisted tightly, and then a screen or a curtain drawn around the vault. Now, at one time, uh, Houdini might have thought that two minutes was the most he could hold an audience performing a trick like this, uh, a seemingly impossible escape. But he found out with enough experience later in his career that if he were in there five or ten minutes, the audience expectation of his having died inside became greater and greater. Fifteen, twenty minutes, perhaps as much as a full hour could transpire. At the end of that hour, when everyone was getting quite panicky, he would suddenly emerge from behind the curtain covered with perspiration, which he had taken care to fake by throwing a glass of water over his face, with his tie uh, awry, his shirt perhaps ripped and his coat in his hand, and with a handcuffs or straitjacket clutched in one fist. Actually, of course, he'd been free within the first one or two minutes of his confinement, had him been sitting on a large stool behind the screen, perhaps reading a newspaper or a magazine. In fact, many times his assistants had to caution him from the wings not to make so much noise with the papers, because uh, as he turned the pages, the audience out front may hear him. This was what made Houdini not just an escape artist, not just a magician, but the great Houdini. The great Houdini. But the more famous he became, the stiffer were the challenges. In Toledo, Ohio, they defied him to escape from a riveted steel boiler. In Boston, from the inside of a washed up killer whale. In Pennsylvania, from a giant football. In every case, Houdini succeeded. At last, America, his own country, accepted him. But always it was back to Europe, where his style paid and where the public paid in style. 
In Paris, he had become the Alhambra's highest ever paid performer. But as his salary rose, so did the demands on his ingenuity. When the Paris police refused to let him do a publicity jail escape, he put on his best Sunday handcuffs and used the River Seine as a convenient vehicle for doubling the demand and the price of theater seats. He hired seven men with ball heads, and they all wore hats. And along the principal thoroughfares, they would sit at a cafe, for example, and together they would lean over and take off their hats, and on seven bald pates you would see H-O-U-D-I-N-I -I spelled out. It looked amusing, but the straitjacket was genuine, the escape no picnic. Inside the canvas, Houdini strained and sweated sometimes for a full hour before releasing himself. The strenuous act took its toll. Later, he had to undergo surgery to remove an abscess caused by the twice nightly performance. Within days of the operation, a blood vessel in one of his kidneys ruptured. His doctor advised the abandonment of all strenuous escapes. Ignoring doctors and the pain that racked his body, he was back on stage in a fortnight. The device that I have on is one of the many punishment suits that was made to hold Harry Houdini. Unlike a straitjacket, instead of being just hip depth, it covers the feet and legs completely. Houdini used to say that in order to get out of a jacket like this, it was very simple. All you had to do was possess the powers to expand and contract your muscles and perhaps dislocate or dislocate one or perhaps both shoulder blades. And I'd like to demonstrate it to you. Step number one, the escape artist gradually works slack around in the jacket, moving the shoulders and using the floor as leverage. Gradually one arm is pulled up over Swiftly over the head. <clears throat> now using my mouth. I unbuckle the jacket. And I'm on my way. I release one of the straps. Come around, release the second one. Yeah, having difficulty with that one, I'll try another one for a moment to get a different position, which is tiresome on the hands. I'll leave that one. <clears throat> I didn't take my buckles off. Get the 
And we're finally made it. It was a tough one. When Houdini heard that his imitators were closing in on his act, then he was prepared to develop that same act a little bit bigger, a great deal higher, and incomparably more dangerously. Soon he left them all behind. constantly faced Harry Houdini was having to come up with new apparatus, new presentations, new tricks, new escapes. Now many of his competitors, as soon as he evolved a certain presentation, would copy it immediately. But the one thing they found difficult to copy was his presentation, his approach to the audience, his ability to captivate and hypnotize that audience. There was one trick called the milk can escape that he made world famous. In fundamental form, it is a large steel can shaped like a gigantic milk can. The performer is placed in handcuffs, lowered inside this can while it is filled with water. The lid is immediately clapped on and the six padlocks fastened. A large black curtain is brought down from the top of the stage and it surrounds the can. And so many moments later, or so many seconds later, the performer would emerge from behind the curtain, the curtain would be taken away, and the milk can is still intact, the lock's still in place, and the escape artist has apparently, by some strange means, made his way out of this watery prison. Now, I'd like to evoke for you the difference between that presentation, the fundamental presentation, and the way that Harry Houdini would have done it. Members of the audience were invited up, and these were not paid stooges in the, in the audience at all. They were ordinary members of the audience, four or five of them, came up from the sides of the stage and came over to examine the can. They kicked it thoroughly and pounded it with their fists and saw that it really was an intact can filled with water. The padlocks were brought up from a member of the audience who owned these padlocks. They were perfectly legitimate. And Houdini would be handcuffed by a policeman who entered from one side of the stage, handcuffed, and he would turn to the audience and say, ladies and gentlemen, I've been handcuffed. I'm going to test your ability to hold your breath. He grabbed the rope, he pulled up, and be lowered away into the can. Of course, as soon as this happened, his body displaced a certain amount of water, and the water gushed in all directions. The music came up in tempo. They rushed forward with another bucket of water, and just as he was about to submerge himself, he would say, ladies and gentlemen, on that clock, you will see 60 seconds elapse, second by second. At the moment that I submerge myself beneath the water, take a deep breath and hold it as long as you can. I'll do it for 60 seconds, and away we go. Down he went into the water. The additional bucket of water was thrown in on top to make sure it was filled. Members of the audience who were on the stage looked into the can and saw that he was indeed beneath the water. The clock started up and seconds ticked off, one after the other. Each person in the audience had taken a breath at the moment that he submerged himself underneath the surface of the water in the milk can. At 15 or 20 seconds, most of them were letting out their breaths. They couldn't hold them any further. Uh, at about 30 seconds, 40 seconds, almost every person in the audience, and before a minute was up, every person in the audience had let out their breaths. And they're looking left and right from person to person to see if anyone could hold his breath as long as Houdini. At the end of 60 seconds, the assistant would slowly walk over to the can, allowing more than 60 seconds to elapse, and wrap on the side of the can. 
Houdini would surge up out of the can with the handcuffs still on, taking a deep breath and panting, his chest heaving, and would say, and now for the test. And down he would go, additional buckets of water, thrown out on top rapidly. The music came up to a tremendous pitch and a fantastic volume, Anchors Away or some such tune, something rousing and exciting. The lid would be clapped on, the padlocks click, 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 six of them. All the way around the can would be fastened on. The black curtain would be flown in. Everybody stood back. Two men in uh, slickers carrying the large fire axes that are usually at the side of theater stages would rush in as if for an emergency, and the clock would start up. That clock ticked off 20 seconds. Most people said, now, I would be drowning. I can only hold my breath that long. We just found out a moment ago. 60 seconds, and they're all saying, perhaps now Houdini is drowning. A minute passed by, a minute and a half, two minutes, two and a half minutes, three. Four minutes went by and the audience by this time was absolutely screaming, save him, let him out. The assistant would rush on stage, would say, get the axes, where are the axes? Here are the axes, take the curtain up. The curtain wouldn't move. Take the curtain up! Houdini is drowning, take the curtain up. People would stand in the audience at this point in hysterics. The lights would all come up on the stage, the band would stop playing. They'd rush forward and just as they were about to put their hand on the curtain, suddenly a hand would come out through the slot in the curtain and Houdini would fall off the top of that milk can just as the curtain was being hauled away, would hit the stage, come to his feet, begin to take a bow and go into a collapse. He would collapse to the stage at the same time that the curtain was coming down at the front and people were screaming and running in from the side of the stage. He would hit the board of the stage at the very second that the curtain did so and everything was oblivion from that moment on. Houdini's greatest ambition, he frequently said, was not to be the world's finest escapologist, but to be worthy of his sainted mother. He admired his mother. Once when he was playing in England, he saw a dress designed for Queen Victoria in a window. Victoria had died. He bought the dress, and when he arranged for his mother to come to Europe, there was the dress for her which she wore in the box of the theater as she saw her son perform. His love for his mother was one of the most powerful passions of his life. Another was an acquisitive admiration for the emerging spectacular technologies of the day. He bought himself an airplane. In their own way, these primitive pieces of wood and canvas were providing competition for Houdini. They were providing vehicles in which men could risk their lives and in risking them take Houdini's headlines. And headlines to Houdini were his life's blood. He hired a mechanic, studied rudimentary aeronautics and waited for the wind. He assumed that the god that had protected his often manacled, straight-jacketed or submerged body would desert him neither on the ground nor in the air. He'd waited two weeks fuming at his inability to control the elements. And now, when the time came for his first escape from gravity, turned his hat in the appropriate direction and prepared to face the challenge. If Blerio could fly the English Channel in 37 minutes, then he, Houdini, could fly double the distance in half the time. accustomed only to success, he bore failure with aplomb and lived to escape another day. In Germany, a policeman by the name of Werner Graf wrote a newspaper article saying that Houdini was a fraud, that he couldn't escape from all restraints because he hadn't escaped from some of the restraints the German police used. Houdini was annoyed. He decided to sue the man for libel. During one of the trials, the policeman brought chains which were used to transport prisoners and Houdini escaped in full view before the judge in the court. And when he finally won, he was so delighted, he had a lithograph made. And up in one corner it says, Apology in the name of the Kaiser. And there you see Houdini in his chains and the helmeted policeman. In Houdini's mind, he hadn't beat one policeman, he had triumphed over the entire force of Germany. If Prussian might could be conquered, then so could the might of gravity, this time in Australia. In 1910, the dangers facing the first men in their uncertain flying machines were as unpredictable as those facing astronauts 60 years later. 
What was not unpredictable then as now was the publicity value. The publicity-hungry Houdini managed to get himself challenged to a race to be first man to fly on that continent. Houdini's Wazam biplane rose from the Antipodean earth like the proud first man-made bird it was. To the Australian crowds who turned out to watch him in their thousands, Houdini was a conqueror, a spectacle, a focus of all eyes and everywhere, something to be looked up to. And to be followed down again, into the harbour, for the packing case challenge. He'd been nailed in by a team of professional carpenters to try to make an escape which, even with a secret release hatch, put death only a few feet from his doubled up manacled body. Houdini learned to check every nut, bolt, lock and rope personally. Others didn't always take the same trouble. In July 1913, Houdini's adored mother dies. Though he'd spent the most part of the 30 years of his working life away from Mama Weiss, her death, when it came, shattered him. For months, he abandoned his act and left alone the props, the challenges and the escapes that had once seemed his only reason for living. He wrote in his diary, my mother was everything to me. Not until she lay dying did I realize how inexpressibly futile is a man's intelligence. He returned to New York to visit her grave daily and began to develop a morbid curiosity in what he called the great mystery, the life hereafter. He neglected his admiring public and began to search for some method of piercing the veil he felt to be dangling between the living and the dead, between him and her. Frequently he was seen to lie on the grave, talking intimately over it, hopefully waiting for some sort of response. It never came. Spiritualism was in fashion, and he embraced it with its promise of maternal and eternal reconciliation. Though what he found, no matter what the quality or the reputation of the spirit medium, was everywhere the cheap trickery of the vogue, phony voices from the dead and fake manifestations of the dear departed. Desperately, he wanted to believe, and in desperation, he went from one seance to another. He was sickened by what he found. Tin pot tricksters with their pathetic bed linen wrapped accomplices. They were not to be tolerated by somebody who'd made a million out of honest trickery. He set about exposing their methods with the vengeance of a man cleverer at their methods than the spiritualists themselves. Houdini the magician was now the exposer of fraudulent mediums. But still he managed to play it to the gallery. Like the true trooper he was, he captured the headlines as he swept through their ranks. And so successfully that his once prominent ego had to be submerged under a series of unlikely disguises in order to gain entry to a spiritualist session. He poured his capital and his time into touring the country, haranguing, exposing, lecturing, and using the muscles he so lovingly had trained for the art of refined escapology. No medium was better than he at ringing a bell with his big toe. 
cold, clammy hand that sometimes touched its way around a spiritualist circle was never more clammy than when manifested by Houdini in paraffin wax. He had little difficulty producing ectoplasm from butter muslin, but the flavor made him sick. And the fated spirit message passed over the subject's head by a secret accomplice in a darkened seance room was never more smoothly slipped into a session than by the practiced sleight of hand of Harry. In 1926, Houdini trod the road to the White House and President Coolidge to have him join the forces against spirit chicanery. At a congressional hearing, he flung $10,000 in bills onto the table for any medium he could not expose. It was not accepted. He just would not stop. He would denounce anybody that he thought was a fraud and take the consequences. So lawsuits began to pile up against him. And those lawsuits were all postponed until he finished his last tour. He managed to get postponements. And there was actually one million dollars in lawsuits filed against him, damage suits, by mediums whom he had exposed and said they were absolute frauds. When the commercial possibilities of the cinema came out of the scene, Houdini fell in love with that medium and took a childlike delight in its particular magic. The golden age of vaudeville had begun to wane, so he joined the Hollywood road in hot pursuit of the pedals of Pauline and the exploits of L.A. He signed a production contract to make The Master Mystery, a 15-part Saturday afternoon neighborhood theater serial starring Quentin Locke, undercover investigator extraordinary for the Department of Justice, alias Harry Houdini. The films were little more than a string of his old escapes linked by a contrived plot. Harry, however, had a naive faith in the sophistication of his audiences. The man who'd made a mint by magic and illusion refused to use the easy, illusory magic of the cinema for cheap effect. He never used a stuntman or trick photography, but insisted on performing his escapes for real exactly as he had on stage.
Would Quentin Locke survive to escape yet again next Saturday? The answer was never really in doubt. A more important question for Harry was would the audiences keep rolling up to the cash desk, for only they could keep him at the top of his profession. It was the era of the romantic matinee idol, and whereas he'd always been a loving husband, he was no Rudolph Valentino, and on-screen embraces embarrassed him. His métier was that of the clean-limbed, fair-fighting hero. He played it for all it was worth. He needed to since he no longer had the vital personal link with his audience that had made his stage escape so successful. Convinced of his drawing power, he formed his own film company, acted as scriptwriter, editor and star. Sadly, the box office gross sank at the same rate as his escapades multiplied to meet his huge financial losses. At the age of 52, Harry Houdini was anything but slowing down. If anything, he was trying harder and harder to keep the attention of the public. On October the 22nd, a very special day, he had been at McGill University near Montreal to lecture on the subject of spiritualism. His lecture had been very well received that day, and a student at that time had made some sketches of Houdini that pleased him a great deal. In fact, that student was invited, along with a friend, to be in Houdini's dressing room in between shows. While he was being interviewed, he was also reading fan mail, and he was reclining on a cot in the dressing room. The student asked him, is it true, Mr. Houdini, that you can take a blow to any part of your body except your face and withstand that blow? Houdini nodded. Yes, that was true. He could do this. He decided to demonstrate for the student, and he rose from the cot. As he did so, unprepared for the blow, the student bent over and punched him in the midriff. Houdini doubled up in pain, gasped, fell back on the cot. He told the student that he should have been warned in advance so that he could tense his muscles for this blow, and he offered to let him try again. He tightened up his stomach muscles. The student hit him a second time. This time, his fist rebounded off an abdomen as hard as a piece of board. Houdini didn't feel too well during the following show, and he suffered a great deal from pains in the abdomen, cramps. It seemed that his appendix had been ruptured. Peritonitis had sent in, and in those days, when peritonitis set in, you were pretty well dead. On October the 31st, 1926, after 10 days of agony, Houdini was dead. The blow he'd encouraged had burst an already inflamed appendix. The victim of his own ego and his belief in his own infallibility, he died in solvent. The whole of New York vaudeville turned out to follow the cortege to Macapella Cemetery where the body was to be laid after a ceremony for which precise instructions had been left by the master showman himself. It had been embalmed and placed in the great bronze coffin he'd used for his burial challenge. If there was to be any escape in death from this, Harry Houdini had made the usual thorough preparations for it. He'd entered into several pacts with his close friends and relations in which he'd assured them that if there were means of speaking with them, he, Houdini, would find it in the great beyond. His widow, Bess, offered $10,000 of her own savings to anybody who could prove to have made contact with her Harry. So, different people, skeptics, Believers alike be began waiting for messages because they knew that there were certain friends of Houdini who had key words from him, which, if he those were revealed in any seance or in any mysterious way, would be evidence that his spirit had returned. But as the years went by, there were no such messages. A few were claimed, but none were proven. Then finally, uh, friends of Houdini's and uh, other people interested in psychic subjects decided to hold seances every Halloween. That was the anniversary of Houdini's death. And they felt that some physical manifestation might account for a return. So we held one of these seances in an apartment of mine in New York about 20 years ago. And there we had what we thought was an excellent test. We had a pair of handcuffs, this pair of handcuffs, which had been given 
by Houdini to his brother Hardeen. And only Houdini knew a way of opening this particular lock without a key. So we had this padlock or this handcuff lying in the middle of the table in the seance room, and there we waited for some manifestation. In order to capture his disembodied voice if it came, they recorded the event for posterity and the proof of the great Houdini's inextinguishable flame. Houdini, are you here? Are you here, Houdini? Please manifest yourself in any way possible. Bessie is here. Your Bessie, who was part of you for 33 years. It means so much to her, to all of us, to the world. The world is listening. Harry, your world, your audience, take from this earnest gathering any strength that may be necessary for you to use. Take any vital thing from us that you may need to enable you to carry out your promise of years ago. We have waited, Houdini, all oh, so long. We are watching and waiting, Harry. Levitate the table, move it. Lift the table, move it, wrap on it. Spell out a code, Harry, please. Do it, Harry, please. Oh, thou spirit, your religion is based on love. And by that very token, a love of 33 years that have even entered into eternity, by that love I ask that you come through with the evidence. The evidence, Harry. Your brother has joined us with a circle. He is formed in New York City, 3,000 miles away. And the circle in Baltimore, in Providence, in Chicago, Leonard, who was once a protege of yours. A circle in Portland, Maine, and in the faithful city of Detroit, in Victoria, Canada, Tacoma, Rockford, Oakland, and San Francisco, all over the world, all joining in. Come through, Harry. Mrs. Houdini, the zero hour has passed. Have you reached a decision? Yes. Houdini did not come through. The Houdini shrine has burned for ten years. I now reverently turn out the light. Good night, Harry. <laughs>